time. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Okay. I guess I wasn't being heard. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Welcome to our lecture series here at the College of Architecture and Design at Lawrence Tech. This evening's program is co-sponsored by Lawrence Tech and UDM. So how many here from UDM? Raise your hands. Well, I've got a few over here. Okay, good, good. Glad to see you made it. Glad for turning out. Okay. We have next semester a whole bunch of, a uh, whole bunch. Listen, I sound like I'm talking about bananas. No. We have guest speakers coming for next semester. But this is the last of our speakers for this semester. And uh, John Norquist will be the one to be happy to tell you that obviously we saved the best for last, right, John? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, just a reminder, architects in the crowd who are looking for continuing ed, we have a sign-up sheet in the back outside. Sign up so you get your continuing ed credits. All right. I'm not going to waste any more time. I'm going to read the introduction and turn John loose on you. John Norquist's work promoting new urbanism as an alternative to sprawl and antidote to sprawl's social and environmental problems draws on his experience as big city mayor and prominent participation in national discussions on urban design and school reform. John was the mayor of Milwaukee from 1988 to 2004, and under his leadership, Milwaukee experienced a decline in poverty, saw a boom in new downtown housing, and became a leading center of education and welfare reform. He has overseen a revision to the city's zoning code and reoriented development around walkable streets and public amenities such as the city's 3.1 mile river walk. He has drawn widespread recognition for championing the removal of eight tenths mile stretch of elevated freeway, cleaning the way for an anticipated 250 million dollar in infill development right down in the heart of Milwaukee. He's a leader in national discussions of urban design and educational issues. John is the author of a text called The Wealth of Cities and has taught courses in urban policy and urban planning at University of Chicago, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee School of Architecture and Urban Planning, and at Marquette University. Uh, John served in the Army Reserves from 1971 to 77, earned his undergraduate and master's degree from the University of Wisconsin, represented the Milwaukee's South and West Sides in the Wisconsin Legislature. He chaired the National League of Cities Task Force on Federal Policy and Family Poverty and served on the Amtrak Reform Council. Wow. <laughs> Do me a favor and help me welcome John Norquist. All right, so uh, the Congress for the New Urbanism is for urbanism. And uh, it was founded uh, in 1993 uh, by a group of uh, d architects and planners and developers and real estate people and local government people, and including me. I was one of the 100 people that, there were about 120 of the 100 people at this meeting, if you ask people at a Congress for the New Urbanism meeting how many were actually there. More people will raise their hand than were actually there. Uh, and that's good. That means they're proud to be associated with the Congress for New Urbanism. So the reason it's called Congress is because, in part, it's meant to be an antidote for the anti-urbanism that made up part of the modernist movement and the SIAM, Congress in international architecture modern. The modernists did a lot of good things, like particularly in the art medium uh, with uh, you know, the great uh, artists like Gustav Klimt and so forth. Um, it's, but in terms of city planning, the anti-urbanism of it was something that, especially the way it manifested itself in the US, was a big problem. So. That's why the name Congress, it's kind of a strange name uh, to have, but 
they couldn't resist. I mean, most of them are architects, so they had to have a strange name for the group. And there's nothing really new. As it says in the Bible, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, it also says that in the Torah, in case you're Jewish. But um, the, uh, the new is there because in 1993, urbanism was so uh, stigmatized that just calling it urbanism, if we were the Congress for urbanism, then you know, urbanism was pretty much associated with despair, decline, uh, uh, problems, you know, pathology. Cities were about uh, poverty and uh, dysfunction, and they weren't as good as the suburbs and all that sort of thing. So uh, it's hard to remember that now because it was only 17 years ago. But that was really the image. That was. Um, uh, the end of a very negative period about cities. So I think that's why the new is there. If we had it to do over, there wouldn't be a new. It would just say Congress for the urbanism. But our initials are CNU. So what are you going to do? You have a branding issue there. So we just kick the can down the road. Maybe someday we'll change the name. Uh, now I want to start out with this picture. This is on the east side of Detroit, right, Mark? Midtown, okay, Midtown. All right, Detroit is a beautiful city and it was a very rich city 100 years ago. Uh, even before the auto industry got going here, it was a rich city. And so the architecture is spectacular. A lot of great architects w did work in Detroit. And the neighborhoods were well planned, laid out, well served with infrastructure. The building materials, very good. Even the worker housing in that era was good. And uh, during World War I, Detroit was one of the major suppliers of uh, war material to the Allies. Also, actually, early in the war, even to the Germans, until the British had really shut the uh, place down. They'd ship it through Holland, which was neutral. And then in World War II, uh, Detroit was the most productive city in the entire world in producing war material, supplied material not just to the U.S. military, but the British and the Soviet Union. A lot of the vehicles that the Soviet Union had were made in Detroit. And so when the Germans were defeated and the Japanese were defeated, it was a triumph for the city of Detroit. So anyway, I just wanted to bring that up at the beginning, that Detroit has this rich history of tremendous, fabulous success and great wealth, and a great place for a lot of people to migrate to because of all the jobs that were here. And it wasn't just the auto industry, a lot of other things. A lot of tinkerers were here. Um, now, I want to talk about sprawl. This is not around here, but it could be easily anywhere around Detroit. The, uh, this is Brookfield, west of Milwaukee. And um, what I want you to see is two things, two intrusions by the government. One is uh, separate use zoning so that all the human habitat, you know, the, the retail is by itself in a pod surrounded by parking. The uh, office is by itself. The housing's by itself. And then the other thing to look at is that makes it what it is, is the streets. The streets are uh, dumbed down from the traditional uh, urban street in a commercial district would be, in a, not a district, but a commercial street. The street would have been for three purposes, movement, uh, economic, and social. So you sell stuff and then you, you know, run into your friends or go to a coffee shop and hang out or whatever. But you can see in suburbia, the uh, street is only for moving vehicles. There's no sidewalk. It's all, this thing's making a lot of noise. You know, I think I'm going to just switch. If it's all right with you up there, I'm going to just turn this off and switch to the mic. OK. 
Can you hear me on this now? Is that right? Okay, so um, and then urbanism also, you know, the idea, we have this idea that sprawl is like a creation of the free market. You know, the Reason Foundation, whatever, you know, the, they would say, well, that's what the people want. That's the free But I just wanted to make the point. The separate use zoning is a government intrusion that forces itself on the market and the, having the streets only for vehicles, that is a government intrusion as well. And then you, you look at urbanism. Here's a very successful neighborhood in Chicago, Wicker Park, a neighborhood that was built up after the Chicago fire um, in the late 19th century. It went through a down period in the 60s and 70s, but now it's considered a really, really uh, high value real estate market. And this is uh, the center of the neighborhood where three streets come together. Uh, Damon, Milwaukee Avenue, and North Avenue, and then there's a transit CTA station there. Um, the zoning in the neighborhood is retail on the first floor, and then either apartments or office above. You actually, the owner, building owner has a choice. They just have to meet a different plumbing code is really the main difference. Um, and the uh, Street dimensions of the neighborhood are interesting. The streets only have one moving lane in each direction with parking all day, even at rush hour. The retail merchants won the battle with the traffic engineers. The purpose of the neighborhood isn't to move traffic as it is in so many neighborhoods in Detroit and in the suburbs of Detroit where the main purpose of the community is moving traffic through the community. All other purposes are, sub, uh, are below that. Uh, in this neighborhood, the traffic is secondary uh, as an important. They don't worry about congestion. And it is a very congested neighborhood. It's congested with traffic. It's also congested with money and people and real estate value. Uh, the policy of the Federal Highway Administration and the Illinois DOT would be to defeat the congestion, to eliminate the congestion. But the neighborhood has been strong enough to resist that, and so it's been very successful uh, at remaining congested with uh, traffic, but also money and people and real estate value, restaurants and things like that. Another neighborhood that is plagued with congestion would be Dundas Street in Toronto, where you have one moving lane in each direction with the streetcar line, a major streetcar line, the Dundas Streetcar, going through the neighborhood people somehow putting up with the fact that it isn't moving all that fast, and the neighborhood is hopelessly congested with money, customers, with real estate value, uh, you know, all tax base that Toronto can call on. Uh, and so that the uh, people that want Toronto's main purpose to be moving vehicles quickly lost, and the people that want Toronto to be a healthy city uh, that people can enjoy, one. The retail merchants won. There's parking even at rush hour. There's no time of day restrictions on parking except in the middle of the night when they clean the streets. Um, now I want to switch a little bit. I, I'm going to have a theme that I'll return to from time to time. It, how we have allowed specialists to uh, undermine the the, one of the great values of cities is their complexity. So, you know, cities are a place where you have people gather and they do different things and, and so they're able to create value. They interact, uh, you know, the, the workplace, the living place, it all comes together and creates something that's greater than the sum of its parts. But when you impose specialties on this uh, situation, it can be very disruptive. So one of the specialties that developed in the uh, post-war period was the parking specialist. So people went to planning school and somehow they came up with the idea of the parking regulations, off-street parking regulations. It, it would have been more logical just to leave that to the property owners and their 
and their tenants to figure out how much parking they actually needed, but the city would impose that on it. So in this case, this is an old street in Milwaukee, Water Street, uh, and sometime in the early 1960s, they put in place a parking off-street parking regulation requiring seven spots on this, what was a vacant lot, all the lots here, but it's a 19-foot frontage spot with a requirement for seven off-street parking spots. So in the buildings are, you know, two, three, five, six stories max. And so nothing was built for 30 years. So we repealed that requirement. And before I could take a picture, the uh, building owner had already started the infill, and they put the building in place because the encumbrance had been removed. It was none of our damn business how many parking spaces that place had. Let, the, let them worry about it. Let the business that there and the tenants worry about it. But in Detroit, your government is still requiring parking spots off street. Why is that so important? You don't have enough people. You, you have way too much parking already. Why are you requiring it by law? And it, all you're doing is suppressing the ability of people to infill the city. Detroit, uh, there's all kinds of things like this, parking regulation, that if they were removed, you would start to see value and infill come back to the city. Not that it still wouldn't have other problems. I'm not talking about miracle cures here. I don't have any miracle cures, except if you do every last thing I say, then maybe it would work. But no, never. Um, or another thing that cities have, and a lot of them around the Midwest, I'm sure Detroit has examples of this. In Milwaukee, um, in the sometime in the late 50s, they started putting uh, uh, non-conforming use restrictions on one side or the other of streets, in this case, National Avenue, which is a ma major east-west street on the south side of the city. The street within the city is about three miles long, so all the property on the right-hand side had a non-conforming use line so that the street could be widened from 50 feet to 72 feet when all the buildings would rot. Now, by doing this line, uh, it made sure that then all the buildings would flunk a title search when people changed the building, or if somebody went in to get a loan to fix their building or to improve it, they would find out that it had a non-conforming use and would be unable to get a permit, or unless they wanted to get a variance and go to the city and go through that pain. Uh, so that gradually, as time would go by with each transaction, the property would rot and lose value. And that way, the city would have to pay less when it finally condemned it. And the buildings could be lost to fire or just fall down. And then eventually, the city could do what it really wanted to do, which was widen the street and make sure that traffic could move faster. Now, if you think about how stupid that is, you've got a street that's about three miles long with you know, eight to 10 buildings on each block. A lot of them, um, you know, maybe two, three, four, in some cases, eight stories tall. So that's millions and millions of dollars of property value that supports the city that the city had condemned to death. Um, you know, asking the planner that came up with this scheme, he wasn't there when I was there, but they still supported the plan when I got there in 88. Um, you know, what was your idea? When you retire someday and you're drawing your pension, you want the city to default and not send the money because the tax base that support your pension has been removed? Or maybe you think the city the major purpose of the city is to drive vehicles through. Uh, you know, imagine doing that in some of the great cities in the world, like Paris or, or uh, Vienna or, uh, or just Canada, Toronto. You know, they don't do that. Uh, so anyway, we repealed that law. And so all these old streets that had non-conforming use lines on them uh, we took them away, and this is an example of what happened. There was an empty lot, and without having to get a variance, the owner of the property built the, up to the property line. If they'd wanted to build back away from the property line, they would have needed a variance. And so the city can start to heal itself 
without having to go through a lot of pain. Um, another thing that, another notion I want to lay out there is the, the idea that um, big boxes are bad. Um, I know at this point Detroit would probably cheerfully accept a lot of big boxes. Uh, but even though this was in a dead mall, this was like the, what's that, Northland? In, well, this was the equivalent of Northland, only the neighborhood that it was in had completely uh, changed in terms of going from uh, white to minority population. And uh, although it was a middle class minority population, uh, for a variety of reasons, the mall had failed, just like malls even fail when they're in rich neighborhoods now. Enclosed malls are sort of out of style. But anyway, the mall had failed in the late 1980s, and so uh, the guy that bought the land removed the buildings at his own expense, and the only ten anchor tenant he could find was Walmart. And I had, you know, uh, Walmart doesn't like unions, okay? You, I don't know if you knew that, but uh, they don't like, they don't want to be union. And um, I, I like unions, I don't have any problem with a union, but the only, here it was in the middle of uh, an African American neighborhood and the, the guy wanted to develop, he needed an anchor tenant, Walmart was willing to go there. So I said fine. And the local alderman finally said fine and we got it through the council and Walmart's there and they do well. Uh, it's a great location for them, and they're they're building in context with other buildings. They're now putting a grocery store in that area in between themselves and the Foot Locker, um, and so uh, you know Walmart actually is willing to be urban. There, there's a sidewalk in front of it. It's on a street called Hope Avenue. Uh, of course, across the street is you know way too much surface parking, but. Um, you know, eventually, I think it'll be a street again, like it, well, it never was, it was a shopping center, but it'll be a real urban place. Uh, in Chicago, where there's a lot of urban prosperity, this is the Lincoln Park neighborhood north of downtown Chicago, uh, Home Depot, that's a Home Depot. But it functions just like a department store. Uh, there's parking in front, you know, metered parking, and there's parking underneath the store and back, but you can't see it from the street. It's a two-story store with escalators, a Home Depot. And people say, well, what do we, you know, with all the, you, you want to buy, you know, big stuff at a Home Depot, you know, you need a place for the trucks and all that. Well, they do have a loading dock in the back in the alley. But, you know, in Lincoln Park, you know what happens? People buy stuff and they have it delivered to their house. That's an option that, you know, Gosh, how did, how did they ever think of that? Well, that, that was an option that would have done years ago. If you had gone to Hudson's department store in downtown Detroit 50 years ago and you ordered something that was big and bulky, you say, well, have it delivered to my house. That was a natural thing. You didn't need to have a, a giant uh, parking lot for everybody. But um, anyway, so it, it, this shows that even Home Depot, the big box company, can come through. But we have these standards uh, that have metastasized and become worse and worse. One of them is by the school facilities planners group, their national group. They wanted to upgrade their profession. You know, they formed this organization, then they have to upgrade their standards. The standards need to be upgraded. So they came up with a standard, a national standard for school sites. 30 acres minimum for a high school, 20 acres minimum for a middle school, and 10 acres minimum for an elementary school. All right, Wrigley Field in Chicago is 8.7 acres. So it has to be bigger than Wrigley Field. It has to be an acre, 1.3 acres bigger than Wrigley Field minimum for an elementary school. Okay, so when Bill Clinton, who's, I like Bill Clinton, so don't get me wrong about this, but when he was governor of Arkansas, he wanted to upgrade education. And so he did. He raised his standard, not on the elementary or the middle school, but he raised it on for, above the national standard to 35 acres. And that's why education is doing so well in Arkansas, <laughs> because they have the 35 acre site 
that upgrading. Uh, that's not far off the mark, you know, out on how ridiculous these national. Why? Do, I'm just speaking. Well, this board of CNU is actually officially for school choice vouchers, so I don't feel any fear about talking about this. But the idea of the national government setting standards for these things is ridiculous. F fortunately, the national government doesn't do this standard. It's the facilities thing. But most states adopt these standards and uh, enforce them. Even New York State, although they exempted the New York City from the 30-acre standard because there's not 30-acre site for anything in New York. Uh, but just to see how this worked, Anderson, Indiana, which is directly south from here, a little bit east of Indianapolis, that was their high school, and then they, which was substandard, below the standard on this small lot, right in the middle of the city where the kids could walk to the high school. Now, they, to meet the standard, they had to move way out, and they now have a parking lot, a big parking lot for the kids. Um, Okay, and then now let's talk about um, offices and how they've been developed over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, you know, the, the tower in the park, the idea of Corbusier, has really manifested itself in the suburban office park with the retention pond um, and then lots of parking. So that's what the ideal was. So while the downtown Detroit was rotting, uh, you know, you'd build these things out on the edge, or down, in this case, uh, it's outside of Milwaukee. It's actually in the city on the far northwest side of Milwaukee, the last area that was annexed in 1964, before the state's prohibition on annexation by the city of Milwaukee went into full force. Uh, that, that was... Uh, Oh, it's a whole other story. Detroit had a similar thing happen to it many years ago. The love that states' governments have for cities is just really hard to describe. Um, but anyway, so we had all these office parks created all over the country. And the one thing you could do is figure out where to park your car. You go there, you know, if there wasn't one lot, there was another one not so far away. So you might have to walk two or three blocks to go to the actual building you want to, but there it is. they solved the parking problem. But what a place. This is Cisco headquarters in Santa Clara County, California, and the commuters are having to uh, commute like, you know, 100 miles because the housing market's so screwed up in California, uh, drive till you qualify, all that sort of thing. So Cisco's actually doing something pretty smart. They're lining their parking lots with condos and apartments and giving their employees first crack at it. And uh, eventually they're going to put in streets and make it into a real place, like a real city. Uh, and it's happening all over. The market's driving this stuff now. It's not happening because of some policy change that happened. But this is a shopping center that this is all built out now, but I have the model because it's easier to uh, see the lines and everything. But um, the Bayshore Mall in a suburb next to Milwaukee, the mall was underperforming. They got rid of the enclosed mall and then put in this mall on blocks and streets, just like an old city. And it's not perfect. There's a few flaws here and there. but. Um, it's worked really well. It, the value of the, the retail sales have tripled since they made the change from the other kind of mall. So the market's starting to drive this urbanism, which is good news for older suburbs and, and uh, the city, and actually good news for Exerbia, too, if they make the transformation. They can uh, retrofit to try to become more urban. Now, another thing I want to mention is Permitting. When I was first elected mayor, I had always, as a legislator, I had wondered why the developers would develop in the suburbs and not in the city. So I asked a bunch of them to come in, the biggest home builders, and uh, they were in my office. I said, um, uh, why don't you build houses in the city? And they said, well, we don't, we don't build low-income housing. I said, ouch. Ooh, what do you mean? 
I didn't ask you if you built low-income housing. I, why don't you build your market rate housing in the city? And then, you know, there, there were a few ugly comments in this. But finally, I got to us a legitimate reason that I could do something about other than, you know, scream at them about some bigotry they were displaying. You know, I, I didn't want to go there. I, I wanted them to actually tell me something that would be useful. So they said, well, the city of Milwaukee has the worst uh, permitting process. It's impossible, and we have no interest in going through that. So uh, I said, you all agree with that? And they said, yes, we all agree. You're the worst. I said, okay, well, um, maybe you can help us make it better, you know, identify the things that really bother you. So we, we actually took that seriously, and about a year later, we had changed a lot of our processes. Our building inspector had done this drawing because he always felt it was a bad system as well. Um, and so we, that was his, the way he thought it, you know, you start and then you stop and you have to go in one building, then go to another building, and you go through all kinds of steps. So this is what he thought we had done when we were finished, and it actually was. I'm telling you. We changed our process, and we started getting developers, not necessarily the ones that were in my office, because uh, some of them had little problems in their head that I couldn't do anything about. But um, we had some guy from Russia named Boris Guckman. He had a lot of money, and I didn't ask where it came from. Um, <laughs> and he, he, I said, no subsidy, and he was fine with that. Uh, I had one guy that uh, said that uh, he had a suburban developer who had done office, I mean, uh, apartment towers, what I call highway apartments next to freeways, with a giant parking lot with a berm around the parking lot and then the large tower, um, like those Mies van der Rohe buildings that are near downtown. They're kind of suburban style. Good buildings, but, you know. That's what this guy had done. The, this wasn't the guy from Russia. So anyway, this guy wanted to come in the city, so he did it. He said, I want to do a 27-acre, I mean a 27-story building on Prospect Avenue, which is on the bluff, looking out over Lake Michigan. And he came in with his lobbyist who said, uh, he, he said, I brought, I brought him in uh, Johnny. He called me Johnny. Like, you know, he was a big lobbyist, and I was merely the mayor. Uh, Johnny, I brought him in to see what he could get here, and then we're going to go down to the other end of the hall and talk to the council to uh, see what we can get for him down there. But, you know, what do you, what do you got to say? I said, nothing. I'm going to give you nothing. Uh, no subsidy. If, it, if you can't build on Lake Michigan with a view of Lake Michigan with your own money, then don't do it. I don't, why? What do you think we're so bad that we have to pay you to be here? Then don't come here. He's, I'm not doing anything. So they started to get up, and they packed their stuff up. And, um, and I said, oh, wait, I will do one thing for you. I'll get you all your permits in three months. And we ended up, uh, the, the, develop, the lobbyist wasn't interested at all. He just wanted money. But the developer said, well, I'll take that. Three months? I said, yeah, three months. I don't know. I didn't really know for sure how I'd do it, but yes, we'll do it. And we did it. We got them all their permits except the plumbing permit, which took a little longer because of the cranky guys in the plumbing office. But um, uh, they're still in a separate building. They're the only part of the process that's in a separate building uh, in um, Milwaukee. But anyway, then the, the Russian guy didn't have any of that, no aggravation. He didn't have a lobbyist. He just wanted permits. And he went out and found sites and just built stuff. And he told me that when he tried to build in the suburbs, they chased him away. They didn't like his Russian accent. They, they didn't have anything to do with him. They always asked, you know, what his plan. Uh, you know, he had a plan. He said, I just want to comply with your code. Um, but anyway, uh, we were really proud of the way it turned around. And a lot of stuff got built because we improved our processes.